This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. This is Herosia uh, Shaib with another episode in our series about the Bitcoin um, block size debate, just kind of leading up and basically setting the table, uh, talking about the different parties and the different aspects of this debate uh, before we get into like the technical nitty gritty of it all. Uh, the first episode of this series is about the philosophy of Bitcoin, like kind of the foundation is started. Uh, the thinking process, if you will, that kind of gravitated people towards uh, Bitcoin as a, a solution to a number of different economic and social and even political problems. Um, the, you know, the, the existence of Bitcoin in itself is a very political idea. And all the various groups that have and political philosophies that have gravitated towards that, that was the uh, first episode. Uh, the second episode, we talked about the coders, the people that worked on the code, the other guys, if you will, besides Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, the people from the very beginning, people that have dipped out, and individuals that worked on a, uh, a proposal, the Bitcoin, uh, the BIPs, which is called um, Bitcoin Improvement Proposals. Uh, those type of individuals, the different type of proposals that you, be, you keep hearing about when it comes to uh, the block size debate. And so we're just going to talk about the nitty gritty on this episode it's about the BIP. Uh, who created it, um, how you can make your own proposal if you want to, how some of these BIPs are implemented into the Bitcoin uh, protocol, but more importantly, how even if a, a BIP hasn't been implemented into the protocol, how as individuals, because Bitcoin is a decentralized system, um, it, it's incorporated in other ways. So before we uh, go on and talk about this episode, we need to talk about the news. So this comes from the Hill report. Uh, the CIA, FBI is hunting for the insider who gave docs to WikiLeaks. So the CIA and FBI are looking for a person responsible for leaking top secret materials detailing CIA tools for surveilling smartphones and other devices, CBS News reported Wednesday. The leaker is to believe in, to be an agency insider. Uh, CBS News, report, News reported citing similar f- sources familiar with the probe. The Manhunt, is, the Manhunt is part of a joint agency investigation into the massive security breach that led to the release of thousands of documents by the website WikiLeaks. Many of the documents were held in highly secure part of the CIA, CIA, meaning that the leaker would most likely have to be someone in the agency, but hundreds of agency employees and contractor, contractors are said to have, have, have some access to the documents. Investigators are being beginning to come through those names. WikiLeaks said in a statement that it had obtained the material from a former contractor. The CIA had not confirmed whether the material released by WikiLeaks is authentic, though it's not, it has not denied its authenticity either. So this is all about the Vault 7, which has continued to be parsed out and leaked by WikiLeaks. You know, the FBI has been very successful in finding, you know, moles in the CIA. Not so much moles in their agency, but moles in the CIA. So we'll see. Uh, robot works 500 times, 500% faster than humans. It puts thousands of jobs at risk. A bricklaying robot that works 500% faster than humans is coming to the UK in a few months. The robot created by New York Farm Construction Robotics highlights the issue of employee displacement caused by automation in the construction industry. Uh, This article comes from Futurism.com. Brick by Brick. Meet Sam, short for a semi-automatic mason, created by the New York-based construction robotics. Sam is capable of laying 3,000 bricks per day, and he's coming to the UK in a few months. Sam can work about 500% faster than humans, and discrepancy in the labor cost that causes is significant. According to the report by Zero Hedge, huh, uh, 3,000 bricks boils down to the cost of 4.5 cents per brick. Based on a 15 hour per, mi- per hour minimum wage rate and benefits, a human bricklayer with an average efficiency of about 500 bricks will cost construction firms about 32 cents per brick. That's more than seven times the cost of an automated bricklayer. Sam isn't able to work independently, however. A builder still has to feed the bricks onto its conveyor belt, which then will be picked up by Sam's robotic arms, slattered with mortar, and placed on the wall. From there, another bricklayer has to follow up Sam's work by cleaning up the excess mortar. Construction robots. Uh, The kind of efficiency is emerging and rising demand for construction services, which means it's likely only a matter of time before technology will undergo mass adoption among construction companies. Yeah, there's like a number of different uh, series of these type of robots, particularly a 3D printed robots. We've talked about them in the past. Like in China, they built a house. People are building houses everywhere from concrete 
to like these plastic uh, settings. It was really going to upset the industry. And then on top of that, you have self-driving cars. I know Google, Wazo's program just is testing out in Arizona. And then you have um, the self-driving car, I think, trucks of Uber maybe or Telsa is one of those um, projects out there that have been testing. And it was from like Las Vegas to I think L.A. of a self-driving um, truck that was put a semi that was put on the road. And then on top of that, you have um, the automation is current, occurring in the fast food industry where in the restaurant industry in general, where you go to your table and there's like a tablet and you just order and then a, a server comes in and gives you your food. There's automation in the sense of uh, where you're having a lot of, um, you see this in Japan a lot in a lot of Asian countries where you have like these little kiosk places where you put money in vending machines and it pops out your food ready made. And I mean, and when I mean ready made, it's kind of like those you see in the hospitals and some workplaces, those coffee makers where uh, they make their cocoa and coffee within the uh, the machine itself. Um, it's like that with particularly um, in Japan and, and um, Asian, South Asian countries. And, you know, noodles is a big staple of their diet. You have that with like a lot of noodle lunch or dinner type of settings there. And also like box um meals of uh, pre-prepared meals that are even heated within as i think a few of them there, there's some that just pop up and you heat it you heat it in a different machine like a microwave or you can just it gets heated by the uh comes hot by the uh, machine itself and you're seeing that like like the yogurt places you've ever been to a yogurt place where there's just one cashier and you basically make your own yogurt you hand the money so there's nobody in the back like you know basket and robins making them you know scooping up your ice cream or making your yogurt for you you're doing it yourself and you're seeing more and more of those type of places popping up where you're seeing less and less humans um, having to deal with those type of activities and it's really displacing a lot of people both at the bottom and the top i think we talked maybe about them on the word of the metaverse where we talked about the ai program the software program that does um that did the the research of lawyers that would took taking lawyers like a year to do it did in minutes, like 500,000 documents. They did all the, the research, take, pulling out all the relevant uh, documentation for the case for the law firm. And then, you, of course, you also have you know the tax situation where, uh, at least here in the States, and I'm sure it's pretty global, but at least here in the States, you know, you have H&R Block. TurboTax was like the big software program that kind of displaced H&R Block. But H&R Block, you know, has his own software program, and there's others out there where you no longer see as many CPAs as uh, you once did when it came to tax season. That was pretty much their, their bed and bread and butter for either individual businesses. And there's less and less of those individuals that have that had hung their shingle. A lot of them end up working uh, within a corporation doing different types types of accounting. That is soon, you know, going to the wayside as well as that is becoming dominated. But anyways, let's just kind of finish up this article here construction robots the kind of efficiency efficiency emerging and rising demands for construction services which means it's likely only a matter of time before the technology will undergo mass adoption among construction companies across the u.s sam has already been deployed in several construction sites now construction robots has announced its entry into the uk market later this year as final finalized negotiations with various construction companies not surprisingly since automation will likely lead to displacement of numerous employees in construction workforce Movement in the direction has been met with a lot of resistance. Many in the field point out the complexities of other aspects of the construction process, which robotics are capably not capable of handling. While this can limit the impact of automation on construction work, it will not eliminate it. SAM is one example of why some experts are calling for a nation to begin developing systems that will ensure our society can function in a world where jobs will become less available to humans. So that you're seeing stuff like uh, universal basic income. Um, you're seeing where there's efforts to basically... Um, get people into uh, jobs and degrees that are heavily specialized where you still need a uh, human to perform it, like, you know, doctors, the people that need to repair or build the robot, you know, creative types, I guess you could say, just really highly specialized skills and get them into that area before automation comes comes for them, really. Uh, basic Universal basic income is one of the bigger solutions that's being bantered around by various levels of governments, corporations, peoples, um, We've talked about it on uh, on Word of the Metaverse. Uh, we talked about the concept of basic income and what that could mean for society in general. But, you know, it's here. It's, it's happening. 
my question is, is now that the um, automation is here, will prices drop? And I'm not sure that is going to be the case. We're going to eventually talk about Kim.com, both on Hiroja Thought Bubble, uh, when his uh, documentary comes out, but also on A Word from the Metaverse. But Kim.com, Caught in the Web, an exclusive first look at the documentary about the mega uploader founder. His trailer was released. It's an exclusive first look at Kim.com, a documentary about one of the world's most notorious internet ent entrepreneurs or pirates, depending on your point of view. The film is about the Germany, Germany-born New Zealand-based founder of uh, Mega Upload will have its world premiere March 13th at, at South by Southwest and is described as a film about ownership, privacy, and privacy in the digital age. According to the U.S. Justice Department, Mega Upload's file sharing business costs copyright owners, including the Hollywood Studios, some $500 million, with the site making at least $175 million in profits during its run, largely from users illegally downloading movies, songs, and TV shows. The five-year-old case has become a major test of international copyright law one of the fastest evolving and most contentious legal issues of the digital age. Dotcom born Kim Schmitz and a permanent resident in New Zealand, where he lives with his family in a palatial splendor surrounded by high-tech security, has been fighting extradition to the U.S. He faces prosecution on charges ranging from copyright infringement to embezzlement, conspiracy, fraud, and money laundering. In late February, a New Zealand judge ruled that Dotcom could be extradited on the criminal charges, an earlier ruling dismissed the copyright infringement aspect of a case and a significant blow to the studios. Nonetheless, if convicted on the criminal charges, Dotcom and three associates also charged face hard time. Dotcom uh, has, Dotcom like Hackers Reform Forum has argued that what subscribers to his site do with the content is not his business and that he shouldn't be held accountable. At his height in 2005, Mega Upload claimed 50 million daily users. In 2012, the Department of Justice shut down and seized control of the site and filed charges against dot .com, who blamed the copyright cartel in Hollywood trying to take control of the monopolies of all human thought per news accounts. Three years in the making, Caught in the Web chronicles the case and goes deep into the dot .com's lavish lifestyle in the South Pacific, where he rented the largest mansion he could find, throwing parties, raves, concerts, and gifting $500,000 fireworks display to his chosen city, of Auckland, according to the film's director, Annie Golson, and producer Alexander Besch. In January 2012, 70 heavily armed and hel helmeted New Zealand police stormed .com's mansion at the FBI's behest, arresting the man and his three coders or co-conspirators co on a range of serious charges related to alleged copyright infringement by Mega Upload. They added, not, now out on bail, .com continues to make multiple waves gathering around him, an unexpected and contrary group of bedfellows. He, a bitstream pirate or folk hero, an underdog taking on the U.S. superpower or a thief, a wealthy businessman or a freedom-loving anarchist, most likely all these things at once. XYC film is handling sales at, at South by Southwest. So this documentary and the one about Cody Wilson should be very interesting. They're both coming out at some point in this year. They're making their rounds to the festival. And I will eventually be reviewing them on Hiroja's Thought Bubble. But, you know, the kitten.com thing is just a very interesting saga in itself. And we'll eventually tackle him on one of these, you know, one of these episodes. But it's out there. And if you happen to be um, at a film festival on this plane, I, you know, I would recommend watching it. He's always been a very fascinating person. And he'd be highly entertaining, but also informational as at the same time i don't think uh, even if you don't agree with what's going on or anything like that he's not a person i would come across as too much of a, a bs person really but that's it for the news on to the episode about the bitcoin improvement before. so what is a bip what does it mean and why is it so important so i'm gonna go for, um from a little bit of, of the bit Coin Wicca, and then uh, we'll read an article from Coindesk. So the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal is a design document for introducing features of, or information to Bitcoin. This is the standard way of communicating ideas since Bitcoin has no formal structure. And I think that's very important because Bitcoin is decentralized. Uh, when we finish talking about the bit improvements, we'll talk a little bit about why some people see the current system a bit of a problem. The first bit, BIP001, was submitted by Amir Taki on August 19th, 2011, and described what a bit is. And we'll read that towards the end when we talk about uh, the improvements of the types of bits, uh, you, the protocol itself. 
So a standard track BIP is changes the network protocol. Um, and we'll talk about the individual ones in reference to the uh, block size debate. Blocks or transaction validation or anything affecting interoperability. So anything that's going to affect the code or the usage of Bitcoin. That's the standard track. Then you have informational bits, uh, design issues, general guidelines. This type of bit is not for proposing new features and do not, does not represent community consensus. So, uh, for example, these improvements to the bit itself are one thing. So there's these different types of proposals or informational designs. Or uh, bit 50, which talked about the soft fork that needed to happen because there was um, a code bug or a code issue with Bitcoin that was issued. That was an informational bit. And then the process bit, they described or proposed a change in the process similar to the standard bits, but apply outside the Bitcoin protocol. So things that might have to do with the wallets or nodes or things like that. A bit workflow, workflow as described by bit 001, the workflow of bit as follows. You have a DAF, a draft, they either is deferred or accepted, rejected, or withdrawn. So these are the things that could happen. It could be drafted first. It might be deferred, might not be utilized at all. It's accepted, rejected, or withdrawn. If it's accepted, it's finaled. Um, if it's finaled, it can be replaced, and it becomes active. So that's based, the basic workflow for a bit. So here's a little bit more of a breakdown from this um, uh, Coindesk, or no, I'm sorry, not Coindesk, Co uh, Crypto Coin News by um, Alex Gorlay. Bitcoin for Mere Mortals Bitcoin Improvement Proposal. So the BIP improvement proposals are designed documents for including features or information to the Bitcoin community. Since Bitcoin has no formal, okay, so we already know that. Okay, we talked about standard informational process. So the preamble. So typically in the process is you have headers containing BIP metadata, BIP number, short title, names, and, and the contact for the authors. So you have, for example, Bit 00999 is what they use. Title, Bitcoin for Mere Mortals, Bits, the author, Alex Corley. Discussion, so you have the status, the type is created, the post history, the places, superseded by, and resolution. So the abstract is typically 200 words, the description of the issue. The copyright is public domain or open publication license uh, because nobody owns anything within the Bitcoin protocol. It's open source, it's free, FOSS, free open source uh, software, so no one can own anything, patents, and we'll eventually talk about patents on this episode, not this particular episode, but down the line, and talk about different types of patents that people are attempting to do, whether individually or companies, uh, when it comes to certain technological aspects or software aspect aspects that people are attempting to do. Motivations. Why the current protocol is unfit, and how this bit solves the problems or the purpose the rationale, why designs, discussions were made, evidence of consensus with the community, and discussion objections. Backwards compatibility. If the BIP is not backwards compatible, it must include a section describing the, in the incompatibilities and, the and their severity. The author must discuss how the plan to address these problems. Reference implementation must be complete before final status, but it must not be complete before the BIP reaches acceptance. Before writing a BIP, the author should vet the idea with the community. The current BIP editor... Um, this article was written 2014, so this has changed. I think is Luke Jr. is the current editor. Is Gregory Maxwell. Uh, right now is uh, Luke Jr. Each BIP should focus on the idea that should not be a small enhancement or patches. New BIPs must make, make technical sense and get reviewed for soundness and completeness. The standard language, grammar, title rules apply. If the BIP needs some work, it will be returned to the author for feedback. If the BIP is ready, it will be assigned a BIP number and added to the GitHub BIP repository listed in the Wika and posted to the Bitcoin mailing list. The author is responsible for collecting and addressing feedback. A reference implication must be accepted and accepted by the community before the BIP will be marked final or rejected. A status of active means the BIP was never meant to become final, like Amir's BIP uh, 1. A complete list of BIP improvements and proposals can be found on the GitHub. If something is discussed, particularly in the Bitcoin mailing list, is where all the devs and members of the community discuss the different BIPs. Anyone can participate in the Bitcoin mailing list and make comments and address issues, review the code, and, and make counter proposals or improvements or find errors or things like of that nature. And that's how these BIPs kind of get um, bantered around and beaten up, if you will. And it's important because you don't want to activate something or add something to the protocol that is not going to work and cause um, destruction or not even really improve the Bitcoin protocol at all or the community at large. I'm going to read this little last bit, this last paragraph from um, 
Crypto Compare. It came out April 20th of 2017. Uh, it talks about the Bitcoin improvement proposal. It reiterates what we already know. But this last, the sum of this bit. The method of using and voting whether each miner includes a piece of code in their Coinbase transactions, i.e. when they win the proof of work challenge between a specific time set by the developers for vote on that particular BIPs proposal. The vote can take place over, let's say, 100 blocks, in which time a mining pool will include its yes or no vote in the blockchain. 30 times of it of its control, 30% of the hashing power, so votes are proportional to the percentage of hashing power attributed to the network. So the process is that the developers make a proposal and the miners vote on it. If there's a majority vote for yes, then the code is implemented by the miners. The majority is defined over 55% of the mining vote for specific change. The mode has led to some criticism in 2015 as developers have vied over the future direction of Bitcoin itself. Uh, with miners voting against various proposals that are not in their interest but potential in the interest of other parties, as the block size becomes insufficient, miners can benefit from the elevated fees as the space in the next block becomes highly sought after. In this manner, the voting proposal of bids can be governed in the interest of, interest of particular industry participants and not the network as a whole. So this is one of the, the issues when it comes to the change of the network. And this can be either considered a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your viewpoint and how you view the network. But it is the miners because they are the ones who verify and play, input the transactions and verify the network that are responsible for activating all these different bits. And this is what's causing a significant amount of delay. Even though there's been SegWit has been proposed all the way back to 2015, and then there's these add-ons or side chains like Lightning Network that haven't been really fully actualized because of this voting methodology. So I have included the original BIP. 001 proposal that was submitted by Mamir Tariq. I'm just going to read some key points from the first one here. So like what belongs to a successful BIP? Uh, each BIP should have the following parts, a preamble, an abstract, a copyright public domain, specification, motivation, rationale, backwards compatibility, reference information. So we kind of talk about the formats and templates, the header. So the formatting is very important. Getting these key points if you want to submit a BIP to they can you know through this process the transferring of the bit ownership occasionally it becomes necessary to transfer ownership of bits to a new champion in general we like to retain the original author as a co-author of the transfer bit but it's really up to the original author a good reason to transfer ownership is because the original author no longer has time or interest in updating it or flowing through with the bit process or has fallen off the face of the net i.e unreachable or not responding to email a bad reason to transfer ownership is because you don't agree with the direction of the bit we try to build a consensus around a bit, but if that's not possible, you can always submit a competing bit. So, like, if there's if the if the bit itself when it's submitted, like for example, it's segregated witness, and there's changes that are happening that maybe the bit author doesn't particularly like, they can always propose a uh, take some of the things that they they got submitted and repropose a different type of bit so that they can work on that new bit proposal instead of the old one. And this all has to do with the fact that the the person who submitted the BIP, once it's been added on, is responsible for all the comments and drafts and and add-ons and comments. They're they're the, the author of the BIP, so they're responsible for making it, in essence, work for the community. Then it talks about the BIP editor. The BIP editor is subscribed to the Bitcoin development mailing list. All BIP-related correspondences should be sent to, in this case, the current one is Luke. Uh, junior, for each new BIP that comes in, the editor does the following. Read the BIP to check if it's ready, sound, and complete. The ideas make technical sense, even if they don't seem likely to be accepted. The title should accurately describe the content. Edit the BIP for language, spelling, grammar, sentence structure, markup uh, for our EST BIPs. Coding style examples should match BIP 8 and 7. If the BIP isn't ready, the editor will send it back to the author for re revision with specific instructions. Once the BIP is ready for the repository, it will be submitted as a pull request for the Bitcoin BIPs repository on the GitHub where it can get further feedback. The BIP editor will assign a BIP number, almost always just the next available number, but sometimes it's in a special joke number like 666 or 3141 in the pull request comments. Merge the pull request when the author is ready. Let the BIP in the ReadyMe meet a wick so that people can read it. Same email back to the BIP author with the next steps. They're posted to the Bitcoin dev mailing list. The BIP editors are intended to fully administrate an editorial responsibility. The BIP editors monitor BIP changes and correct any structure, grammar, spelling, or markup mistakes we see. 
And then there was changes with uh, BIP02 to this process and BIP123. Uh, and that has to do with classification. So standard BIPs are placed in one or four layers, consensus, peer service, API, slash RPC, and application. Non-standard BIPs may be placed in these layers or none at all. So this is BIP123. Consensus layer. Consensus layer defines cryptographic comment structures. Its purpose is to ensure that anyone can locally evaluate whether a particular state or history is valid, proving the settlement guarantees and ensuring eventual convergence. The consensus layer is not concerned with how message messages are propagated on the network. Disagreements over the consensus layer can result in network partitioning or forks where different nodes might end up accepting different incompatible histories. We further subdivide consensus layer changes into soft forks and hard forks. So the change that's going to happen, you, you're going to have to state what type of change is going to occur. Is it a soft fork? Some structures were valid under the old rules are no longer valued under valued the new rules. Structures that were invalid under the old rules continue to be invalid under the new rules. Hard forks. In a hard fork structure, structures were invalid under the old rules become valid under the new rules. A peer service layer. The peer service layer specifies how nodes find each other and propagate messages. Only a subset of, of all specified peer services are required for basic node interoperability. Nodes can support further optional extensions. It's always possible to add new services without breaking compatibility with existing services and then gradually depreciate older services. In this manner, the entire network can be upgraded without serious risk or service disruption. So this is where you know, stuff like block extensions is the type of solutions being proposed. Bitcoin Unlimited might fall under the peer service layer. We'll, we'll discuss those when we discuss this, the type of solutions. But this has to do with the nodes, and those are the ones who uh, keep the ledger going, if you will. Once they get the, the block from the miners, they add it into the, to the ledger and propagate so everyone knows... Our, um, what is being spent and what's being utilized, and there's no st double spending. It's verifying, you know, that's the purpose of nodes, is verifying what is on the ledger. They keep, they're the record keepers, if you will. The API slash RPC layer. Uh, the API slash RPC layer specifies higher level calls, accessibility to applications, supporting these BIPs is not required for basic network interoperability, but it might be expected for some client applications, so like wallets. The room of this layer is to allow for com competing standards without breaking basic network interoperability. Application layer. The application layer specifies high-level structures, abstractions, and conventions that allow different applications to support similar features and share data. data. Classification of existing BIPs. And then the, the layer is, uh, it goes back and it, and it changes, you know, what it is. Like, for example, BIP 12 is consensus soft fork. Uh, 13 is application, BIP 14 is peer services, which was a protocol version and user agent. Uh, 16 is consensus soft work. So when we go back down to 141, BIP 141 is a consensus soft work, segregated witness. Um, 142 has to do with address format for segregated witnesses. That's an application. Um, category. 143 is consensus soft work, and 144 is peer services, a segregated witness. And then 145 deals with APIs and RPCs, updates for segregated witness. And then 146 is consensus soft work, dealing with signature encoding malleability. And 147, consensus soft work, is dealing with dummy stack element malleability. 150 is peer services, which is peer authenticating. So these are the type of categories on what these type of bit proposals will do to the network and it is up to the community or in a sense the miners to determine whether or not they wish to activate these type of proposals. Now Coindance is a site that kind of keeps track of different aspects of the Bitcoin community. They have like the volume, vanity addresses, poker services, statistics, Nodes, political opinion, blocks, and resources. So on Coin Dance, they have the Bitcoin node summary, and they show what types of nodes are actually utilizing the current code protocol. So, for example, right now there are 25 nodes that are operating Bitcoin XT nodes. Those are the ones that were proposed under Bit. Um, 
No, it's not Bit 100. Um, 139 is Bitcoin Classic nodes. That's the Bit 100 proposal. That's a, I believe that's the Mike Hearn proposal. 689 is the Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, and then the current code that has the majority of the nodes. There's 5,973 of those nodes out there. They're running the Bitcoin Core nodes. And so you can have these nodes actually propagating and putting forth these um, bit implementations to try to sway the network a different way. It also on this has a supported by Bitcoin proposals, the community management support breakdown by company for each active proposal. So it has like segregated witness, emergent consensus, UASFF, which is Bit148, which is a user um, soft fork for segregated witness, extension block, which is a new proposal, and it breaks down by percentage. So there's two different proposals for the segregated witness implementation. 87% uh, is the first one. Emergent consensus is 25%. Um, BIP 148 is at 18%, and extension box, one of the newer proposals, is at 4%. And we'll, we'll get into the difference of that when we get down to the nitty gritty. But this is just a good way to kind of measure what's going on in the community. And really, what it is is because Bitcoin is decentralized. Um, you know, you're not going to get, you know, just one thought or one person thinking one way. You're going to have a bunch of different voices, varying different positions. And you're, everyone's kind of jockeying to see, um, you know, what is the best improvement. So this article comes from News BTC. It was written by, uh, Gotham. It was, doesn't state when it came out. One second. So Bitcoin improvement proposals need more than a developer. Bitcoin improvement proposals are proposals for making change to the Bitcoin network. Uh, we kind of know already this information, so here we are. Over the past two years, a number of BIPs have been put forth by various members of the Bitcoin community. These proposals call for a block size to be increased from anywhere between 1 megabyte and 32 megabytes. Each of these proposals have received their fair share of opposition, and some more than others. And some of the proposals so far include, so BIP 100 wasn't uh, my current, it was Jeff Garzik. A Bitcoin core developer suggests the increase in range between existing 1 bit to 32 megabytes, depending upon the, the miner's vote. BIP 101 is also known as Bit Bitcoin XT, proposed by Gavin Andreessen and Mike Hearn. The proposal suggests the block size be increased by existing 1 bit megabit, 1 megabyte to 8 megabytes, followed by additional increase of 8 megabytes every two years. BIP 102 proposed, proposed doubling of the current block size from 1 megabyte to 2 megabyte. Jeff Garza was behind this proposal as well. And then BIP 103 was posed by Peter Will, and it's just for the block size to be incrementally increased by 17.7% .7 every year for the next 47 years. All these proposals were either shot down or not taken seriously until a few developers came to, to deduce Bitcoin Classic. And Bitcoin Classic proposes the block size to be increased by 1 megabyte. It has gained a lot of traction since then, with many Bitcoin companies and industries supporting it. So it doesn't even get into the segregated witnesses, which go further down. This is a very early article. Any proposal to implement changes in the Bitcoin network is usually introduced by the Bitcoin core developer community. But the fate of these proposals lies in the hands of the whole community, or at least a significant portion of the community. The proposals cannot be implemented without the consensus of miners. It's hard to satisfy all members of the community, as they all have their own interests to serve. For any successful proposal, the developer or group of developers introduced should think through various subject aspects. Some of the subject aspects are earlier mentioned by Elliot Odds in one of his recent blogs. It takes more than a developer to introduce the right bit. Bitcoin developers may be good at developing the technical part of the digital currency. However, some of the decisions to be made when it comes to real-world visibility and adoption can't be completely understood by using technology. For example, factors like appropriate cost of setting up a full node, the social aspects of digital currency and how the digital currency is used and so on. So like, for example, um, not everyone can, if you were to download 
the entire block ledger, it can take anywhere from three to five days for you to fully get it. Um, and <laughs> that is a lot of time to have your, you know, your computer spending to, to download something. Not to mention, not everyone has the bandwidth to keep a full node going. There's electricity costs, things of that nature. And so that can um, economically put people out, but also highly concentrate these nodes. And if you look at our node chart in the first world countries, and so it's not allowing for the global decentralized aspect of Bitcoin to propagate, if you will. At the same time, people utilize Bitcoin in different methods. For example, we talked about um, earlier on in the concept um, during philo the philosophy episode about the whole debate about coffee and how some people don't see buying coffee with Bitcoin as a practical usage of the, the Bitcoin um, and consider it spam. So there's that. For the Bitcoin community to grow and for more people to start using Bitcoin while ensuring the longevity of the Bitcoin network, the digital currency needs more than developers. The success of failure of Bitcoin as a currency depends on how well it addresses the common various uh, the, the address the concerns various people might have. Developing the right roadmap for Bitcoin development and maintenance, maintenance requires additional expertise in economic, human psychology, and ethics. In the absence of such expertise, developers in any Untrained individuals may create a biased roadmap. Such roadmaps or proposals are met with opposition, i.g. proposals to increase box size by those who might have a different view of things. This will continue to be challenged in a decentralized democratic system. The best way to avoid such scenarios is by requesting inputs from all stakeholders and then framing a proposal that addresses concerns of all stakeholders. It will avoid debates and help reach consensus sooner. So this is one of the big, huge critiques about the BIT process and the fact that it's not completely decentralized like the very nature of Bitcoin in itself, um, that you have to go through this process to order to um, implement any changes to the Bitcoin protocol. Um, there's other cryptocurrencies that have um, sort of addressed those concerns, like Dash has a voting process where people can vote on different proposals. Uh, you just put it up there for the entire community to look at and view the code. You don't have to have a pre-approval by the developers uh, who might maintain the code in it itself. Uh, this has also become an issue with the various solutions that people are proposing to address the issue of the block size. Um, a lot of them are not coming directly from Bitcoin Core, and since Bitcoin Core uh, those developers maintain the code, they're automatically sort of rejecting some of these proposals that other people have because they didn't go through the process at all. And so there's a lot of contention that's adding this um, very weird, tense layer within the, um, the debate on this subject because you didn't go through this uh, approval or authoritative process. So before we talk about like how people can implement and why there's these nodes have these different types of requirements or are implementing certain aspects of these BIPs into their software program. We need to talk a little bit about Libra Bitcoin. So Libra Bitcoin is a set of cross-platform open source C++ libraries for building Bitcoin application. Uh, the toolkit consists of libraries, examples, test application. The project was established on three principles. Privacy, Bitcoin should always remain as private as possible for its users, scalability, Bitcoin, Bitcoin built today with the future in mind and integrity. Uh, no individual group should have enough power to, over the network to compromise the original aims, which can kind of get into the when we talk about the miners, how that status has been changing. Uh, this is developed by Amir Tariq. Uh, so, like, and I'm getting this from the uh, Wicca, uh, Bitcoin Wicca. So like what Lipcoin is actively maintained since version 2.0, the original projects of Lipcoin, Obelisk, and Subvert X have rationalized under a common repository and build system. Uh, Lipcoin includes a dedicated consensus library. The library provides a clean interface to the 34 source codes and headers from the Bitcoin core, considered consensus critical. It also includes Python and Java swig bindings, and the use of the library is optional when building. A single Signed single file application binaries are available for Bitcoin Explorer, Bitcoin Nodes, and Bitcoin servers for Linux, OX, 
and when and Windows platforms. Extensive, extensive end users and developer documentation is provided for Bitcoin Explorer. Uh, the repositories include standard auto tools builds, supporting GCC and Clang, as well as robust Visual Studio solutions. So this is a, just a repository of the code that allow people to tinker build and build off of and i think it's very important because it allows for a better understanding and open source um, of the bitcoin protocol in of itself uh, and, it, and because it focuses on the three big things that people kind of utilize uh, as a way of um, participating uh, with bitcoin and you know the bitcoin explorer which is the understanding the uh, blockchain if you will the bitcoin nodes which is you know the public ledger maintaining that and bitcoin servers so the history uh the lipo the lipa coin was the second full implementation of bitcoin after the original client it was created by the community of open source developers led by amir taik the first comments were by patrick starton on, on may 18th 2011 and lipa coin was announced on july 21st 2011 the related command line applications uh, Severta X was announced on November 2nd of 2011, and then it just kind of goes through the the, um, <clears throat> the different implementations, like adding the Bitcoin servers um, part was May 9th of 2015, Bitcoin node as a cheap, a cheap parity with Bitcoin server on December 21st, 2015. As a release of a quality full node, and all repositories were updated to version 3.0 on March 7th of 2017, including substantial performance and quality and feature improvements. So right now, the active maintainer is Eric Voskill, um, Philip Manikin, Neil, Neil Miller, William Sanson, Pablo Castino, Santino, Monero, Marnino, and Saka. And early contributors, again, was Amir Taik. Patrick Strangham, and even Luke Dash Jr. Uh, and then there was Dennis Ruo and Robert Wilson. Uh, projects using Lipcoin, and this is important because when we talk about businesses, is Airbits, Bitprim, um, CanCoin, ChipChap, DarkLeaks, Dark Wallet, Dark Market, Mastering Bitcoin the Book, The Metaverse, Open Bazaar, Slur, and Teachain. So this is just a building program that's important, and this is a aspect of adding towards the concept of different ideas that can help build um you know the the bitcoin infrastructure and it's just another thing that amir Tariq, uh one of the earlier coders and contributors to the bitcoin had built for the community so let's talk about wallets and how it is that some of these wallets that are out there can implement certain um aspects of these BIPs that weren't approved by the Bitcore and added into the code and not, you know, fuck things up, if you will. So this comes from BitPay as uh, a Bitcoin wallet comparison. Uh, we work with developers and wallet vendors to design and promote technical standards which improve the security and ease of using Bitcoin. We maintain this page as a resource for identifying wallet support of these standards. Bitcoin URE support or BIP21. This is a standard for the two tap payment experience. Users can follow a link or scan a QR code and support wallets automatically prepare a payment for the proper amount to the correct address. The BIP payment protocol support, BIP70, 71, 72, and 73. The payment protocol standard enables a secure payment request, secure payment destinations, and payment experience improvements. These include payment received notifications, predetermined refund addresses and secure proof of payment. So let's talk about these BIPs right here. 70, 71, 72, 73, and 21. So 21 is final. It's um, something that has been kind of put into the place here for, for, for the Bitcoin protocol. And then we drop down to 70, 71. They too are final aspects, 70, 71, 72, and 73. So these are kind of the standard coding protocols that allow for people to um, operate wallets. And then it, BitPay breaks down what a true wallet is. True wallets are Bitcoin wallets with which users control the keys to their own Bitcoin. The SIN Bitcoin wallet software uses a secret key, much like a password, to move the Bitcoin. The new owner's wallet software then stores its new secret key. And then it um, breaks down which ones had the, the two payment method, which is pretty standard in the payment protocols, 
which is not standard. Some people don't have the, if you send, um, for example, I have a mycelium wallet. So if I were to send my Bitcoin wallet might have like a hundred bit dollars in it. And I wanted to send $25 out to purse.io. And so I send that out. And so I'm not using, reusing addresses. What would happen was I, the amount would go out to $25 out to um, purse.io. But internally within my um, wallet, if you will, that $100 is then sent in the remainder, $75, is transferred to a different uh, bid address. And it allows for um, my address is not to be tied so directly towards me. And other wallets do this as well as a way of preventing, um, you know, moving your money within your wallet, preventing um, reusage, if you will. They do it kind of automatically for you. So anyways, you have BitCore, BitPay Wallet, and Bread Wallet and MySealing on top here. They use both the Bitcoin UR, the, the standard, you know, scan the QR codes, type in the address and send it, and the payment protocols. And then you have AirBits, Bitcoin Wallet, Bitcoin Go, Electrum, Green Addresses, Multi, HD, Ledger Wallets, Armory, BitWallet, Blockchain, Alpha, IFA Wallet, Coin, and Coin, and Coin, uh, crypto kit um, don't use that last bit, the 70 through uh, 73 payment protocol. And then Bitcoin accounting services uh, too. Accounting services manage a Bitcoin wallet on behalf of its users, much like a bank manages the customer's funds. Account services can be used as Bitcoin wallets, so users should keep in mind many of these institutions do not insure consumers for the loss of deposits via theft, fraud, or bankruptcy. It is also not uncommon for account services to delay sending Bitcoin, which can slow down purchase experience and cause unnecessary hassles for users. So BitUR's payment, pro payment protocol. BitX does this, and Circle, Coinbase, and X XPO just do the BitUREs. If you're trying to make a payment from one of these services to a BitPay invoice and the payment hasn't been sent, we recommend contacting the institution support services. Coinbase base gets a lot of flack for uh, delays in sitting out Bitcoin, but also closing down accounts and not refunding people's money. Because again, we talked about this um, when we talk about the, the series of episodes for the Silk Road Marketplace about fungibility. If the coins you have received or the coins you're sending out are going to a nefarious or quote, and I put those in quotes, nefarious, um, organization like a drug buy or something that they don't approve of they will they will close down your account and they won't send those coins out so it's you is in your best interest to try to control and use a wallet that you have complete and full access of your bitcoins and that's why um i'm talking about this like these wallets can and cannot you don't have to implement the entire um BIP system when creating their wallets, they can choose pick and choose which BIPs they can do, and it doesn't mess up the network or even mess up the usage of um, your user experience because you don't have to have all these BIPs, these different type of uh, BIPs for the payment, the wallet usage in your your wallet if you don't want to, and it, it, it basically it's like a software feature. It's like a feature. The best example I can give is like if you use like stickers, you know, which is started with Snapchat. You don't have to add stickers um, to share photos or whatever. That's just an option for you. And some uh, messaging services and some sharing um, photo sharing services have the sticker option. Uh, Facebook didn't have the sticker option. And eventually added it on. But to order to use the Facebook Messenger and share with your friends, you didn't have to have that feature. It's just, you know, your photo went up there and you shared it or whatever and you had that type of experience. But when you added the stickers, then it changed the nature of the experience. But the whole process of sharing your, you know, your photos on the online, you don't need to have stickers, but it's just nice to have stickers. It may make the experience and usage of photo sharing much better for you personally between yourself, your friends, or even for business purposes, if you will. But it's not going to, you know, your photo is not going to be shared or put out there on the internet if you don't have a sticker on it. It's the most simplest 
way I can break down the, the different aspects of um, wallet usage. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, because of the nature of Bitcoin, because as we explained with the Silk Road Marketplace about fungibility and Bitcoin um, blockchain spies, there are wallets like Samurai Wallet and a few others that are in development and coming out there that are implementing some of these bits that have to do with payment codes and payment protocols, which is Bit47, and um, pri any kind of privacy add-ons that they're trying to add to their wallet that allows it to work within the Bitcoin system and work within their wallet, but doesn't you know, break Bitcoin or break their wallet or allows you to, or you, you lose your, your Bitcoin transactions, particularly uh, Bit47, which deals with payment protocols where, so you, so what a Bit47 is, and this is, I'm just reading off the, the Samurai website, add a public payment code to send a Bitcoin anonymously, scan a payment code to open a payment channel. A payment channel will be created between both wallets by sending a special transaction on the blockchain. This is called a broadcast transaction and requires one network confirmation to confirm. Tap to send. Once the broadcast transaction is confirmed, the payment channel is open. Simply tap the channel name to send Bitcoin directly to the wallet. No need to know their address. So, for example, someone has a payment channel that says, like for me, a Heroja Space Odyssey Network. Someone wants to send uh, to, that, to that channel, to that payment code, Without anyone knowing that they're doing it, uh, they would have to have a wallet, either a Samurai wallet or a similar wallet that has added this feature into their wallet program, uh, the BIP47 proposal, and you, they can then um, type in, you know, Heroja Space Odyssey Network as the name of the payment channel, and it's sent to that channel, and then, and then it's not known or tracked through the blockchain um, spy network, if you will. That that those funds were either sent, you know what the amount was, or sent, or anything like that. It's kind of hidden. It's protected. It's privacy protected, and so I think you're going to start seeing more and more of this done for the simple fact that one, it only takes one confirmation transaction, and two, uh, more and more people are getting very concerned about fungibility and privacy with the usage of Bitcoin and don't want to get either knocked out off the network, blacklisted, or um, have any issues simply because they, um, you know, they made a purchase that uh, somebody out there disagrees, whether it be a government or uh, frowned upon um, by the community as a whole. And then just an understanding of what, um, what other type of wallets out there are doing, uh, Bitcoin Armory, is a Python-based, fully realized Bitcoin wallet software. Uh, it was one of the more popular wallets out there. Um, this is from their website. So what is Armory? Armory is a Bitcoin wallet. It stores and protects the private keys necessary for you to spend Bitcoin. It keeps track of all the Bitcoin that you have sent and received and allows you to spend Bitcoin with ease. Armory's primary focus is to absolutely secure the cryptographic schemes were chosen for their robustness and resistance to attack. The ability to use... Um, and air gap storage and cold storage allow the best security we could think of, physical separation, and overall Armory is designed to be the most secure Bitcoin wallet out there. And it talks about what type of bits uh, it supports. It, the BIPs it supports 11, 13, 16 for pay to script hash addresses and multi-signature scripts, uh, BIP14 for the protocol version of the user agent string, BIP21 for the, the typical usage of the, you know, the QR code scan and the, the sending, like typing in the Bitcoin wallet, the UR scheme, BIP31 for PON network messages, 6266 for low S and strict VRE signatures, and then it's prepared itself depending on when deployment occurs for segregated witness, so BIP41, 4344. So it's letting its um, users know that when the time comes, you, you can use your wallet for segregated witness transactions. And then they plan to utilize BIP32, which is for hier uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets. And then it has this comment down here. If the full node is based on Bitcoin Core, then yes. Otherwise, most likely not. Armory directly reads from the block data files that BitCore and its forks produce. They relies on the P2P network messages and the Johnson RPC servers in order to communicate with Bitcoin Core. 
is a full node software does not use the same block data file format used by BigCore and does not support the same Jostin RPC function, then it will not be compatible with Armory. So if you have, um, you're shitting a Bitcoin from a, a wallet that uses Bitcoin Unlimited or Bitcoin XT or uh, Bitcoin Classic, then, and you're sending it to Armory, then it's not going to be read by them. And that's important because with these different types of nodes out there to try to change the protocol or support to something different, um, or even with the extender block solution proposal that's out there, by them having this up front, unless you know that your 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 bitcoins are not going to be received by this particular wallet, it's not going to read it. And also, just a side note, there's a lot of wallets out there that use the HD wallets. So when they're saying that they're HD wallets, it means that they are BIP32 compliant. And so there's wallets that are built around the, the BIP proposal of BIP32. So there's that flexibility, if you will, um, when it comes to Bitcoin for the different services built around Bitcoin, like the wallets and the nodes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the nodes when it comes to these bits in a moment, but just for the wallet part, that's why you have these different styles of wallets and it just kind of fits your needs. And it kind of is in the spirit with uh, decentralization in the sense that, and peer-to-peer in the sense that individuals can choose how they wish to interact with the network and remove themselves from the network or participate with the network in a different way. And that's why you have all these different types of wallets and wallet services out there. And you can have an understanding, like when you go and read their about about page and see like what type of bits are they supporting, supporting. Are they supporting segregated witness? Maybe you're, you're not a segregated witness supporter so maybe you don't want to utilize a wallet that's already potentially has that um, aspect enabled and when the next software update occurs with your wallet maybe you want to remove your coins from there or you want to utilize a wallet that has you know is compatible with segregated witness and so you want to move your coins to that particular wallet and then there's a, the concept of payment codes and any other BIPs that might come along dealing with wallets that might add a privacy feature that does not require a complete change of the Bitcoin code. It might be just a wallet-to-wallet -wallet interaction that uh, transacts through these diff to the software to the wallets without, you know, broadcasting your information to the Bitcoin, allows for the validation of your Bitcoin being sent and not everyone seeing what's going on. Um, through the blockchain blockchain network is you know obfuscated so that's that's very important and very unique um in the sense of you know what bitcoin is overall as a community and as a platform um that this aspect of it is still strong within the community of how you um give fit um and change your needs based on the the type of wallet you're using out there so I'm going to talk about the nodes and then originally I was going to talk about the solutions proposed through the Bitcoin through the bits, but I'm going to save that for our technical aspect of the breakdown of what those, what those are, um, for another time or I want to say another time, but for that particular episode where I, I go to the nitty gritty of the breakdown, if you will. So just like wallets, and we touched on it a little bit on the top of this episode, uh, you can have different nodes operating off of different bits. You have the Bitcoin Classic, the Bitcoin XT, the Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, and pretty soon there'll be block extension nodes and different implement implementations that people um, who are seeking to, you know, provide their solution to the block size debate or putting these nodes out there and the reason why this is important again is it's the, the decentralization of bitcoin the fact that you have to get a consensus and that people can put up these nodes with a different type of code and it's um adding to the public ledger and eventually you know right now bitcoin core the current code as it is is in the majority so it is the chain that everyone's following but if you get, you know, one of these solutions happening, whether it's uh, through 
and we'll talk about the user software fork solution uh, when we talk about the solutions or the minor solution proposals. Uh, you can. This is why people fear a hard fork, but if you get a consensus where everyone jumps onto Unlimited or people go back and go to XT um, and they put up the nodes and the miners approve and things like th of that nature, or just a software, f user software where you, everyone puts all these different type of nodes that are for that one solution. It's because of that, it's because of these BIPs and because they can add this code without um, an attempt, if you will, to not break the network. So currently, like as we stated earlier, there's 140 Bitcoin Classic nodes. Uh, Bitcoin XT is 25 and Bitcoin Unlimited. And then we have the, the initial um, Bitcoin core. So going from Coindesk, and, you know, Bitcoin XT is the fork of the Bitcoin reference client initially developed by Big, Mike Kern and Gavin and Neeson. It achieved significant attention when the Bitcoin community in 2015 amid a contentious debate among core developers over increasing the block size cap. It includes a number of upgrades to the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, such as more reliable relaying of double spins and support of larger blocks. The protocol scaling plan is for a 2 megabyte hard fork after a minor supermajority of 75% in a one month grace period. So if you get enough of these nodes going on and if, if the, if the uh, miners were to activate that particular proposal, um, this is what the, the, you have the nodes ready to go, if you will, to support the miners. Its features are a two megabyte block plus blocks, uh, BIP64, thin blocks, BIP109, Traffic shaping, double spending relay, BIP 113, and mandatory spam filters, BIP 68. Check sequence verifier is a new uh, opcode for Bitcoin scripting system as a combination with BIP 68. It allows executions of pathways of scripts to be restricted based on the age of the output being spent. Version bits with timeout delay, it changes the semantics of version field and Bitcoin blocks, allowing multiple backward compatible changes. Compact blocks uh, on the wire as a way to save bandwidth and nodes on the peer-to-peer -peer network. And relays are double spinning when they are seen so sellers can learn about attempts to defraud them faster. So that is that is what the, the code for a node is doing. But mind you, the node is the record keeper, if you will. is keeping the record of what the um, is going on through the blockchain. And... So they're important to the network. You need them out there. Bitcoin Classic. Bitcoin Classic stands for the original Bitcoin and Satoshi describe it as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If you're writing the software that, that miners and users say they want, we will make it sure it solves the needs and help them deploy it and gracefully upgrade the Bitcoin's network come together. The data shows that Bitcoin can grow on-chain to welcome many more users onto our coin in a safe and distributed manner. In the future, we will continue to release updates that are in line with the Satoshi White Paper and Vision and were agreed upon by the community. So it has Lipsec 256K, Emergent Consensus, which tracks network consensus rules and allows a free market to emerge. Uh, X thin blocks, which differ from other thin block uh, strategies. Extreme thin blocks use simple bloom filters and a new class of transactions. A typical one megabyte block can be reduced to 10K bit size to 25k big thin size um, bip 68 bip 113 flexible transactions and mandatory spam filters uh, spam filtering support which cannot be turned off or configured uh, what is bitcoin unlimited bitcoin unlimited is a fork of the bitcoin core reference client with the intention of providing a voice to all stakeholders in the bitcoin ecosystem the project seeks to remove existing practical barriers as stakeholders express their views in these ways. The protocol scaling plan, a BU, BUIP001 fixed block limit made obsolete. BU follows the blockchain with the most uh, proof of work as per the original Nakamoto consensus. Separation of the mining block size, default 1 megabyte for the non-mining block size, acceptance to default of 16, 16 megabyte. Block size limits and acceptance depth, depth individual configurable. So again, it has Lipsic uh, 2561 emerging consensus. The network tracks the network consistent rules and allows the free market to emerge. 
traffic shaping, easily configured how much bandwidth should be used, allowing the client to run obtrusively in a home network, um, extend blocks, target block filters, um, mandatory spam filters, automatic blockchain pruning, discards blockchain data when it's no longer needed, expedited block forwarding, pure nodes can be pre-configured for a single hop, extend block propagation, and faster block rate, relay by removing handshake messaging, a zero MQ notification. It doesn't state what that is. Interesting. So that's what Bitcoin Unlimited is. And those are the nodes along with the Bitcoin Core nodes, which is the current QT or the third client developed by and based off of the reference code by Natoshi Nogamoto. And that, that's the one that has um, the most consensus. Its protocol scaling plan is SegWit plus Lightning Network, uh, Shorn Signatures, and Mass. So those are the potential proposals that have not yet been activate, act, activated. It has transaction fee bumping, mandatory spam filters, everyone's doing that, manual blockchain and pruning, uh, BIP113, automatic blockchain pruning, uh, check sequence, verifier, BIP68, RBF is opt-in relay, opt-in full replaced by fee signal, SegWit, and version bits with timeout and delay. So these are the nodes out there. They're seeking to um, be part of whatever the, the you can say, the, the, the chain that wins type of a deal. And so that's it for the episode. This is just kind of giving, the, again, a lay of the land, what BIPs are. So when you hear these proposals out there, you have an understanding what a BIP is, how it comes into implementation, uh, who works on it, how it's worked upon, how, you know, like wallets and nodes interact with bits. Um, when we talk about miners, we'll talk about how miners interact with bits and, you know, the different issues and problems that people have with the bit process in itself. So thank you for listening and um, to the moon, uh, the next episode. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you. And until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.